Um, so there's been a wave of protests around the world against systemic racism. And your company had launched something called Capital as a Service. Can you describe what that is for the audience and describe how the investments made through that were different demographically from traditional venture investments? Um, capital as a service, you know, well, it built on something else before. So I, I, I this is a topic that's very sensitive to me. Um, I've kind of always believed that bias existed. Um, I've also kind of believed that I overcame it because, um, you know, maybe I was more articulate or frankly, smarter, faster, better um, than my white counterparts. And so I kind of always excelled. Um, but um, but actually, Shamath, can you just flesh out what you mean by that? Because I, I don't know if every one of my listeners will know um, your personal story. Uh, I mean, you know, look, I, I, uh, I was born in Sri Lanka. And uh, at the age of six, I moved to Canada. Um, there was a civil war in my country. Um, my parents filed for refugee status, and then I stayed. Um, I grew up on welfare. My mother was a housekeeper. Uh, my father was, uh, you know, uh, in and out of uh, uh, jobs, couldn't really keep jobs, um, you know, suffered from some depression, suffered from some alcoholism. Uh, it was just a really tough, shitty way to grow up in some ways. But, you know, they were good people and they tried their best. Um, I was a byproduct of a lot of social uh, safety nets, uh, healthcare education being the principal too. And, uh, I went to college for a few thousand dollars a year in Canada. Uh, I was able to emigrate to the United States. Um, and I was kind of able to pull myself up for my bootstraps. I came from nothing. Um, and, uh, I've, you know, reasonably accomplished a lot. Um, but there are so many people in the same boundary conditions that I grew up um, that didn't make anywhere near as much progress. And it's not because they weren't as talented. Um, and this is what I mean by there are, I, I, I've been I'm very lucky. So one very telling example, I remember that we had to face an immigration judge when I was 10 or 11 years old. Um, and this was like my father's final appeal, like, you know, where it's like, we need to, you know, you need to let us stay in Canada because we can't go back, you know, we'll, you know, our lives are at risk. And I just remember like, you know, this mid forties or early fifties white judge and this guy sitting on a bench and he decides my entire fate. And I bring it up because it's such a, it's seared into my memory. And I just sat beside my father and it's kind of like a courtroom setting. If you can imagine a courtroom setting. Um, and I was just crying from beginning to end of the whole thing, just bawling inconsolably, just this fear and, uh, uh, an insecurity um, because you feel so illegitimate, you know, you just feel like you don't belong. And it's at the benevolence of this one person in that moment, the entire, you know, course of your life is set. He allowed us to stay. Um, and he, you know, believed that it was more important for us to stay. And, you know, those things define you as an example. Um, so we stay and, you know, we try our best. And, um, you know, I would say that, you know, we've given back, uh, you know, I've paid billions of dollars in taxes. Uh, I've donated, you know, tens of millions of dollars back to Canada. I, I feel like I, I really have honored his decision, but it still kind of leaves, you know, this taste in my mouth, which is like, wow, that's a coin flip that could have gone the other way. And I wouldn't be here. Um, you know, 9-11 happens. And um, for five years, I would get these, uh, it would literally say on my boarding pass, SSS. And, uh, you know, you get security screened, a secondary security screen, but like, you know, they take everything out. They ask you the million trillion questions. And then I finally realized that I was just being racially profiled after 9-11 because maybe they thought I was, you know, some Muslim extremist. And I thought, I mean, do you have to walk around with a sign that says you don't have to be afraid of me? I'm not, you know, I'm just here to you know, get, get from Washington, D.C. to New York uh, to go to a meeting. Um, you know, when I lived in D.C. and I worked for AOL, I got pulled over by the cops so many times. Um, when I was in California, I got pulled over by the cops so many times. And everything that I've gone through is like a one. And my black friends, what they've gone through is like a thousand. Um, and they go through these even more extreme scenarios of when things happen to them, you know. Um, 
So, you know, look, my, my, my worldview is, is just kind of framed in the sense that there's just a lot of things that have not been set right. Um, and one of the things that we have not done a good job of is acknowledging and confronting sort of the systemic combination of fear and ignorance and racism that just exists. When I started Social Capital, the first thing that I did, one of the first projects that I did outside of the investing business was I partnered with Jessica Lesson at The Information. And I said, we're going to decompose the demographic and racial makeup of every single investor in venture capital. And we published it. And people were so upset. And I remember writing this article called Bros Funding Bros. <laughs> uh, and they hated it. Uh, but they hated it because it was the truth and they were getting called out and they felt uncomfortable. And what's, you know, and I think that they've kept it up since then. Um, then, you know, I took it to the next level, which was we started this thing called Capital as a Service. And that was this idea that, you know, entrepreneurs exist in all shades, colors, genders, sexual orientations. And instead of allowing you know, a bunch of guys with unconscious bias to make this decision, why don't we just let the numbers speak? Um, and you found incredible businesses run by all kinds of people all over the world uh, because we would allow them to just provide us their data and we would make automatic funding decisions with an algorithm. And that algorithm couldn't care what your first or last name was or your gender was or where you were from. It just looked at the quality of your business and made some reasonable forecasts about what the future could look like and would give you capital. Um, so I've kind of believed that, you know, a lot of folks want to do the right thing. Um, white folks, um, they don't necessarily know how, um, this is a moment where people have started to really have some hard conversations and live in the discomfort for the first time, you know, amongst my white friends, what I would tell you is like they're, they listen to things in a way that they hadn't before. Um, I don't know what happens from here. Um, but I think things like capital as a service, I think things like, you know, publishing the demographic profile of the venture community, forcing change is probably what's needed. Um, and uh, money flow is a really critical part of writing uh, and making things more balanced because um, money is lubricant. And, uh, you know, when you have access to it, you can do a lot more things than when you don't have access to it. And I've been on both sides of this, so I can tell you this. Yeah. And uh, just to make it clear for the audience, um, under capital as a service, the demographics of the funded companies have been 30% female led instead of 4% in traditional VC. And they're 80% non white, as opposed to 77% white in traditional VC. So um, quite different numbers uh, when it's the algorithm investing. 